tend to be where the light and darkness meet on the edge of the horizon through the trees. I am a narcissist crippled with self doubt. I've got a courage that brings me to my knees. Hello, hi, and howdy. How's everybody doing today? I certainly hope everyone is doing great. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Jenny, and it's very nice to meet you. If you are a return visitor, as always, welcome back. If you get anything out of this content, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment with your thoughts. If you have a story suggestion, please email it to me at Jenny, period, Elisa, period, discusses at gmail.com. I do my best to reply to everyone. Today's story is a suggestion from Susan Hill. And Susan, if you see this, thank you so much for the suggestion. Now, let's jump in. Chandler Ashton McLean Norris, which was his legal name on his birth certificate, but he was known as Chandler Ashton Grafner. He was born on the 12th of April in 2000 in Colorado to Christina Leanne Grafner, who was born in October of 1979, and Josh Norris. Chandler had a rough go at life, and none of it was his own fault. His mother suffered with addiction. It was reported that she was neglectful to her boys, Chandler and his younger brother, Dominique Phillips, who, per fine grave, was described as Chandler's best friend. Christina and Josh did not stay in a relationship, and Christina soon entered a relationship with John Phillips, who she had Chandler's younger brother, Dominique, with. On the 7th of October in 2004, per a child fatality review with the Colorado Department of Human Services, a County Department of Human Services received a referral from a mandated reporter with concerns of CA and neglect on Chandler and his younger brother. The report stated at the time four-year-old Chandler was not potty trained and still sucking on a bottle. The department made several attempts to contact the family and finally was able to interview Christina and Chandler. Chandler was observed and determined to be healthy by a caseworker. The caseworker did document concerns regarding the family's circumstances as the family had moved six times in the past year. Christina told the caseworker she was concerned about her boyfriend at the time, John Phillips. Her concerns included allegations of DV and John having an addiction to pain pills. She said she had fears that John may hurt Chandler. The caseworker told Christina not to leave Chandler alone with John. She offered options for safe places to go and cautioned her that if she felt herself or her children were in danger, to take her children and leave. She wasn't able to make contact with John even after several attempts, and she closed the case with a risk level of medium. On the 16th of June in 2005, Denver County Department of Human Services received a referral stating Christina was smoking around her child who had asthma. The allegations were again ruled unfounded, and the report stated both children were with John Richard Phillips at the time. On the 23rd of September in 2005, Chandler, now five years old, and a neighbor child that, per the report, was three years old, were found walking down E. Dry Creek, a very busy major street at 9.30 a.m., and it was discovered that the children had been missing for about 50 minutes when they were found. Christina was charged with CA, knowing, and reckless. On the 2nd of November in 2005, Christina pled guilty to the charges and was placed on probation for a term of one year. On the 7th of December in 2005, another referral was made to include allegations that Chandler was beyond out of control and that Christina refused to take him for counseling. When the social worker spoke with Christina, she acknowledged that Chandler was having behavioral problems and that they would get worse when he would visit John Phillips. She told them that she had left John due to heavy substance use and he had a drinking problem. She said that she did believe that John was abusive to the children. The caseworker urged Christina to get Medicaid and seek mental health treatment for Chandler. She documented that both children appeared developmentally appropriate, 
clean, and well-dressed, and when questioned, Chandler denied any bruises from spanking. Christina's mother, Sandra, informed the caseworker that she wouldn't be allowing Christina to reside with her much longer and that she felt Christina was lying to the caseworkers. She said she felt Christina was using substances and drinking and that Christina was abusing and neglecting the children. They documented that risk level was high but concluded there were no current safety issues to warrant legal action. On the 14th of December in 2005, Sandra, Christina's mother, contacted the Arapahoe County Department of Human Services and informed them that Christina had taken the children and moved to Jefferson County. And on the 15th of December, she called them again with an address that the department reported they could not confirm. On the 26th of March in 2006, the department received a call from law enforcement that Christina had been arrested for a traffic violation as her vehicle was found blocking traffic and she appeared to be under the influence of substances. Both boys were taken into protective custody. The report stated the children appeared neglected and told the officers that they had not eaten since the day before. They further noted neither of the boys were in car seats and they were not wearing shoes. The department gave temporary custody of the boys to Christina's mother, Sandra Younger. A home study done at Sandra's uncovered she was allowing Christina unsupervised visitations with the boys, despite a court order forbidding it. They also learned that Sandra was driving the boys around without a driver's license or insurance on the car and that she did not have car seats for the boys. They also noted that Sandra had a roommate living in her home that had a criminal history. Josh Norris, Chandler's biological father, was out of the state in the military and was unable to be contacted. Sandra and an aunt to the boys suggested that John Phillips would be a suitable home for the boys. On the 18th of May in 2006, custody of the boys was transferred to John Phillips, the youngest of the boys' biological father. In July of 2006, John Phillips and living girlfriend and teacher Sarah Berry was added as a special respondent. A case plan was created for the boys, including daycare arrangements were to be established. John would follow up with Jefferson Center for mental health referrals as counseling for the children. They would arrange visitation for the boys with Christina's family and allow supervised visitation with Christina. The children could only be transferred in vehicles with car seats and insurance and must be driven by only licensed drivers no smoking in the home or the vehicle with the children. Neither John nor Christina signed the care plan, but it was adopted by the courts. After John refused to allow visitation or communication with Sandra, she withdrew her support for the placement. Christina made no effort to engage in a treatment plan and a petition was filed to terminate her parental rights. The petition was dropped soon after, however, John simply responded in writing to receiving the treatment plan. He was asked to take random urinalysis. He said that he felt statements made to the department by Christina had affected the stance the ongoing caseworker had taken with him and caused her to prejudge him. The department was unable to get John to take a urinalysis, and he claimed this was due to misinformation provided to him by a caseworker. In a report from the department on January the 2nd in 2007, the boys were described as really thriving in their current placement. It was further reported in the same report that Christina attended only one parenting time visit with the children in April of 2006 and had made no contact since then with the caseworker. The children were seen in July of 2006 at Evergreen Pediatrics by the caseworker contacted the office and learned no health issues were noted. Chandler was very thin, but not considered underweight. John told the caseworker that the children did not have a dentist, but he had not scheduled any appointments with the dentist, and though the caseworker provided several referrals for mental health counseling for Chandler, John did not follow up with any of them. On the 11th of January in 2007, there was a review of the treatment plan held, and the caseworker said that John had successfully completed 
30 days of clean urinalysis testing and had completed the requirements of the treatment plan. She asked that full allocation of parental responsibility be granted to John. She also said the visitation with the mother should be at John's discretion. She further asked the court to dismiss the case. On the 17th of January in 2007 at 4.37 p.m., a report was made by the staff at the Denver Public School to Jefferson County Department of Human Services that a teacher's aide noticed severe bruising on Chandler's ear and a bruise was noticed on his neck. She also noted that the skin looked raised and that he had welts that looked like fingerprints. She said that she asked Chandler what happened and he said that his dad squeezed his neck. He said his neck didn't hurt, but his ear did. He further said, quote, my dad clobbered me. His kindergarten teacher also examined Chandler and noticed his right ear was very dark, very blue, very black, and he had red around his neck. She asked him what happened and he told her that his dad kept hitting him in the ear while he was in the shower. He was then taken to the acting principal who also noted his right ear was very swollen and very, very bruised. It was completely black and blue on the inside and the outside of the ear. When she asked him what happened, Chandler told her that his daddy put him in the shower and kept hitting him over and over again in the ear. The acting principal asked Chandler why his daddy did this, and he said he was mad because his brother made them steal some candy. He further said that he sometimes had to eat his dinner in the shower. She asked Chandler if anyone had done anything to tend to his ear, and he said that John gave him ice and a hat. He told the principal nothing like this had happened before, and he was not scared to go home. The following day, the 18th of January, in 2007, the teacher's aide took Chandler to the school nurse's office. The nurse noticed the top three-quarters of Chandler's ear was black and blue and swollen. She testified in court that she asked Chandler what happened, and he said that he had been held under the shower and hit in the ear as a punishment. On the 19th of January in 2007, a caseworker with Denver DHS attempted to make contact with John and Chandler. When unable to make contact, the caseworker made contact with the school and learned that John had contacted the school that morning and told them Chandler would not be attending school that day. The caseworker then returned to the home to attempt to make contact, but no one answered the door, so she left a note on the door for John to contact her. 8.10 p.m. on the 19th of January, the caseworker requested law enforcement to do a welfare check on Chandler. They were not able to make contact. On the 20th, a second request was made for a welfare check, and this time at 1.56 p.m., contact was made. Chandler and Dominique were taken to the Family Crisis Center for assessment. They observed slight bruising on the right ear of Chandler, and they photographed it. Chandler also lifted his hair on the left side of his forehead and revealed a bump and a bruise that was very purple. He also had a scratch on his little nose. He was asked what happened and he said that he was slapped. He then said the bathroom floor is very slippery and that he fell. When asked who hurt him, Chandler would not answer. He was then asked if he had breakfast and he responded, quote, I'm not good so I don't get things. A caseworker then began to interview with both Chandler and Dominique. She said that she occasionally got up and walked around the room and let the boys talk. She put on a movie so they would be comfortable. She asked Chandler if he knew the difference between the truth and a lie. He told her that he would not go to jail if he told the truth. She asked him what happened to his ear, and he said he slipped and fell in the shower. She later asked him the same question, and he gave the same response, but this time he added, it was not dad's fault, end quote. He went on to say that when they were bad, they have to take showers, and when they're good, that they're allowed to take baths. She gave him a break and overheard Chandler tell Dominique that he had not been able to get a watch because he was bad. Chandler further said that he had stolen candy from Mom and Dad. She said that Chandler then said to Dominique, You weren't listening, and Dad asked you why you were being like me. 
That's so heartbreaking. The caseworker testified she then took Chandler and Dominic to the department's cafeteria, and when she opened the door to the refrigerator, Chandler's eyes just lit up. He appeared very excited, very happy, and started to point to everything in the refrigerator. He wanted a little bit of it all. He ate three hot dogs, a bag of chips, pudding, and a glass of milk. The caseworker consulted with her supervisor, and they decided to fill out a safety plan requiring John and Sarah to appear at the department the following Monday. The plan required them to not discuss Chandler's injuries and to not discipline the boys. She then drove the boys home. During the trip home, she heard Dominique say, well, sometimes they're bad to us. She asked Dominique to explain his statement, and he said that sometimes they were made to eat nasty food. Chandler then spoke up and said, Dominique, you know they respect us. She always tells us they respect us. Dominique said yes, but sometimes they make us take showers and not baths. The caseworker made it to the house and met with John and Sarah and had them sign the safety plan. Chandler's kindergarten teacher testified that she ever heard Chandler announce to the other children in the classroom, my parents are mad at the teacher. My parents don't like her. She took Chandler aside and she asked him why he would say these things and he said, because you keep interrogating me. He then said, anyway, I just fell down in the shower. She asked him if his parents told him to say this and he said yes. The teacher called the acting principal about what was said, and Chandler told her that he was not allowed to talk to the teacher and that his dad was angry because the school called social services. The principal told Chandler, a school is a safe place, and it is not okay to hurt someone, and it's not okay for anyone to hurt him, no matter who they are. Chandler just said okay. On the 22nd of January in 2007, Chandler again talked to the school nurse. He told her that he had been to the police station and she asked if the police looked at his injuries and he said yes. Chandler then told her that no one hit him and that's what he wanted her to know. He said his parents were mad that the school called social services and he wasn't allowed to say anything anymore. She testified when she first talked to Chandler, he was happy and bubbly but now he was more subdued and serious. On the 22nd of January in 2007, the entire family was ordered to the Denver Police Department for a further investigation. John and living girlfriend Sarah said that they believed the report was in retaliation from the school as they had a conflict with them. A teacher at home elementary said that she reported signs of neglect to Chandler at least four times. However, investigators visited the home per Sandra Younger and said that they, they found nothing out of the ordinary. On the 6th of March in 2007, the teacher's aide noticed that skin around Chandler's eyes was very red and bruised. She asked him where he had been because at the time the school was having a problem with, with pink eye. Chandler responded, I am supposed to tell you that I have pink eye. The teacher's aide further testified that on the 9th of March in 2007, in the morning, Chandler approached her and grabbed her hand. He looked at her and he asked her to stop interrogating him because when she does, he gets in so much trouble. She said he was literally begging and pleading. That afternoon, the 9th of March, Chandler was withdrew from school. John and Sarah claimed that they were going to homeschool. On the 7th of April in 2007, John's mother had an Easter dinner at her home, including several family members. She testified that Chandler appeared to be in good health with no injuries. John's older brother testified that John and Sarah had grounded Chandler for lying and blaming Sarah for hurting him. Because Chandler was grounded, he was not allowed to sit with the family, he was not allowed to watch TV, and he could only eat oatmeal while everyone else ate pork roast, potatoes, vegetables, and dessert. I don't know John's mother, but I can promise you I would not allow that at my house. There's no way. The 12th of April, Chandler turned seven years old with no celebration. On the 28th of April, Sarah called John at work and left a voicemail saying, quote, Hey babe, sorry to bother you at work. Dominique just called me over and said that Chandler told him that you and I had better get him something to drink or he's going to get out of there 
come into the kitchen, get a knife, and unalight us both with a knife. So I just don't know how to handle it or what to do. So um, give me a call, please. I love you. Bye. On the 6th of May in 2007, around 9.20 a.m., John left for work early saying something was wrong with one of his contact lenses. At 10 a.m., he called his supervisor and said he would not return to work because his son was having asthma issues. Just before 3 o'clock p.m., John called 911. Seven seconds after he made the call, the firefighters, who were only a block and a half away at the time, received the call from dispatch and arrived at the apartment. They found John performing CPR on Chandler, and Sarah was on the phone. Per the testimony given by the firefighter, John and Sarah were fairly relaxed considering the conditions. The firefighters checked Chandler for a pulse in multiple locations, but they found none. They began CPR. Within five more minutes, the paramedics arrived. John told them that Chandler had been eating and drinking 10 minutes earlier, but then for no reason collapsed in front of the television. He went on to say that Chandler had been sick with flu-like symptoms for a week prior, but they had given him Gatorade, Benadryl, multivitamins, and a nebulizer, and it was not abnormal for Chandler to be so skinny because he ate like a horse but wouldn't gain weight. Chandler was so emaciated that the paramedics had a hard time finding a vein to administer any medication. They had to drill a hole into a bone below one of his knees to give him any fluids or medication. They testified that they noticed through all of this, neither John nor Sarah showed any emotion or interest in what was happening or where Chandler would be taken. For 45 minutes, both at the apartment and en route to Swedish Medical Center, Paramedics continued to perform CPR, but at the hospital, Chandler was pronounced deceased. One of the responding firefighters testified that Chandler was extremely skinny. He said that he appeared very malnourished. He said Chandler's skin was very cool and dry. He further observed that Chandler's little body was very dirty and that he had multiple bruises on his face and his back. He also had a cut above his left eye that appeared to be healing. The left side of his face was bruised, and he had blood-colored fluid coming out of his left ear. He appeared to have blue fingernail beds, which the paramedics said was probably from lack of oxygen, and he was lying in vomit. A police officer that attended the scene said that Chandler looked like his bones had been wrapped in skin with no underlying muscle. A worker at the hospital said that he was very dirty and that he smelled very bad. Also to testify was the director of pediatric medicine with the Swedish Medical Center who pronounced Chandler's time of death. She initially observed Chandler in the ER. She said nothing prepared her for that moment. She said that he was skin and bones and you could see every bone in his face. You could see every bone in his pelvis. No chronic illness child that she had seen in all of her years looked anything like what she saw when she saw Chandler. She said, quote, the first thought that I remember having was that it looked like the pictures that you see from someone in a concentration camp, but it was worse, end quote. She further testified that in 14 years, she had never seen a child in the horrific physical condition that Chandler was in. She said when Chandler was admitted to the hospital, he had an internal body temperature of 84 degrees, which along with some other physical conditions meant, in her view, that he had been deceased for a minimum of an hour before 911 was called. She said that his abdomen was concave like a bowl. He did not have one bit of muscle tissue on his body. He could not have walked or stood on the day that he passed away because his legs had no muscle and were held at a funny angle. He had multiple cuts and bed sores. Um, his back displayed post-mortem gravitational flow of blood, usually occurring an hour after death. She testified that John told her Chandler had had flu-like symptoms for the past week and a half, but Chandler had been drinking Gatorade and eating oatmeal. The entire time, Chandler's skin was tinting, meaning that he had severe dehydration, which was inconsistent with the claim that he'd been drinking Gatorade. The defense tried to say that Chandler suffered ketoacidosis, 
but the doctor testified that his physical condition was not even close to looking like, like a normal patient suffering from diabetic ketoacidosis. Per the autopsy that was performed on Chandler the morning after his death, he weighed 34 pounds. The coroner said in his medical opinion the cause of Chandler's death was dehydration and starvation due to restricted fluid and food intake. Chandler's physical description um, at the autopsy was a young male child with dry flaky skin, small abrasions and some contusions and bruises, thinning hair which pulled out easily, sunken eyes and sunken cheeks. He said Chandler basically looked like a skeleton. He further said that Chandler's extremities, particularly, they have somewhat of a broomstick appearance. He said that Chandler's skin was tinting and his internal organs were very dry compared to a normal autopsy. In his bladder, Chandler had a quarter of a teaspoon of urine. In his stomach, Chandler had a half a cup of mucoid brown liquid that was probably just gastric and intestinal secretions. Chandler had elevated levels of sodium, chloride, and urea nitrogen in the vitreous humor of the eyes, which were consistent with dehydration, and in his opinion, Chandler did not die from diabetic ketoacidosis. On the 7th of May in 2007, police officers executed a search warrant on John's apartment. The detective testified that as soon as he entered the apartment, he immediately smelled odors of urine, human feces, and cleaning products. He said that the refrigerator had been rigged, so the main door would not open unless the upper freezer door was pulled. The smell of human feces became stronger and more intense as he moved further into the apartment. The smell was strongest at the closet, which was almost overwhelming in one spot and was coming from the floor. He found a receipt dated two days prior to Chandler's passing that listed as being purchased a true air unit, filter breeze, and an air purifier, several canisters of air freshener, a canister of disinfectant, and a chemical odor reducer in the apartment. It looked like somebody had cleaned the wall of the closet and whoever did it had left streaks. There was a fan in the bathroom window turned on high and pointed such that it would blow the air out of the apartment. The closet door had been modified so that it would not open either from the inside or by a child from the outside. The modifications to the door had been removed prior to the police officer's arrival. A hidden security camera that was monitoring the kitchen was found. The floor space in the closet was 29 inches by 35 inches and 18 inches of headroom. This is the amount of space a person would have had if confined in this linen closet and a piece of carpet the investigative team had removed from the garbage truck fit the space like a glove inside this closet. Various crime scene investigators testified that there were upward oriented fingerprints on the inside of the closet door as if someone had been touching the door from the inside with their hand facing upwards. A feces covered cardboard box, a feces covered green and white striped inflatable mattress, a feces covered piece of carpet that matched the carpet, and a purple towel were all found in a local dump. The baseboards at the bottom of the closet and the closet doors were stained with fecal matter and the mattress, the piece of carpet, and the lowest shelf in the closet all tested positive for Chandler's feces. The true story of what happened to Chandler was told by his brother, Dominique, who was a child himself, and what he had to say is beyond heartbreaking. Dominic was only six years old when he would testify against his father, which is rare. He sat in a room adjacent to the courtroom that his father was in, and he testified via a closed-circuit television screen, which was visible to the jury, members of the courtroom, as well as to the public. He said that his father, John, and his father's living girlfriend, Sarah, said whenever Chandler was bad, he would be put in a linen closet for days. He wasn't allowed bathroom breaks, so he would poop in the closet, and it would soil the walls and this would make John and Sarah even angrier. 
They would then take him out of the closet and give him a mean shower, and then they put him back into the closet. He said that prior to Chandler's passing, John and Sarah had stopped giving the boys lunch at all, only Captain Crunch for breakfast and then dinner. He said that tacos were the best, but he was only allowed one. He said Chandler often wasn't given any food at all, and when he was, it was oatmeal, and he would have to eat it in the closet. He said at times Chandler would ask Dominic to get him something to eat, but Dominic would refuse because he was scared. He said that he often heard Chandler inside of the closet say, I'm hungry and I want to get out of time out. Also to testify was Dominic's therapist. She testified that she began therapy sessions with Dominic on the 10th of May in 2007. She said that he told her when Chandler stole food and John and Sarah made him go into the closet and the door would be closed and locked on him. When Chandler was in the closet, he would not be allowed to use the bathroom, so he would have to poop and pee on himself. Also while in the closet, Chandler once drank bleach water because Sarah would not allow him to have regular water. Chandler stole food because he was hungry. Chandler often asked John and Sarah for food because he was hungry. Chandler often asked to get out of the closet, and sometimes John and Sarah would let him out of the closet, but sometimes they would not. And Chandler would also ask Dominique to help him get some food and water, but Dominique told his therapist that his dad didn't want people to know about the closet. Dominique said that on the day Chandler died, Chandler wasn't able to talk because his throat was hurting, and John took the box and sheet that had been in the closet where Chandler was confined to a nearby dumpster and called an ambulance. He said that John then sat on the couch and watched TV until the ambulance arrived. A detective also testified that on May 6th and May 7th, he interviewed Dominic and videotaped the interviews. Each of the videotapes lasted about 50 minutes and were shared with the court. On the 6th of May, Dominic told the officers that when he or Chandler were bad, they had to take the mean cold showers. Chandler got into trouble for stealing food multiple times, and on the day he passed away, Sarah and John had to change Chandler's clothes in the living room really super duper fast because he was sick, and when the ambulance came, Chandler was still shaking. Once while John was giving Chandler a shower, Chandler slipped, fell, and he hurt his head. Chandler's head turned real red and would take a long time before it turned back white again. Chandler would cry until his shower was over, and when the shower was over, Chandler was put back into the closet. During closing arguments, prosecutor David Lamb pointed at John and said, Phillips kept Grafner inside a closet as a form of punishment, and he knew exactly what he was doing. He chose to deprive this child of water and chose to deprive him of food, knowing what everyone in this room knows, that if you do that, the child is going to die. Here's what we know. The sun rises in the east. It sets in the west. We know there are seven days in a week, and we know if you don't feed a child, they die. Defense attorney Darren Cantor said in his closing, not days, not hours, but weeks. Where's a single neighbor to come in and tell you they heard screams? One scream, much less repeated screams. After hearing the testimonies given, the jury made their decisions. John Phillips was convicted of first degree unaliving, CA resulting in unaliving, and tampering with physical evidence. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the unaliving, 48 years for CA resulting in death, and one year for tampering with evidence. Each sentence was to be served consecutively. The day prior to the trial beginning for Sarah Berry, August the 12th in 2008, Sarah took a plea. She pled guilty to second degree unaliving and received a sentence of 48 years in prison with the possibility of parole. John Richard Phillips was sentenced on the 12th of August in 2008. His DOC number is 142671 and he is located at the Fremont Correctional Facility and Sarah was sentenced formally on the 29th of September in 2008. Her DOC number is 143217, and she is eligible for a parole hearing in January of 2038. 
She is serving her sentence at the Denver Women's Correctional Facility. In 2016, John won an appeal and was resentenced. It was ruled that the consecutive sentences were improper and they were to be ran concurrent. However, this really is kind of a waste of time because it's not going to change anything as he's sentenced to life without parole. Following the death of Chandler Grafner, Chandler's biological parents, Christina Grafner and Joshua Norris, filed a lawsuit with the personal representative and administrator of Chandler's estate, Melissa Schwartz. The lawsuit alleged multiple government defendants failed to ensure Chandler's safety despite multiple reports of abuse. The lawsuit was filed against Jefferson County, where Chandler attended school, and two Denver supervisors in the investigation, Mary Piegler and Margaret Booker. Christina and Joshua argue that the government defendants had deprived Chandler of his constitutional right to be free from an unreasonable risk of harm. The defendants argued that once custody was given to John Phillips, the government no longer had responsibility over this child. Piegler and Booker accused Joshua of trying to profit off the death of a child he never knew. It was ruled by U.S. District Court Judge William J. Martinez that the defendants were not liable, but in June of 2014, Joshua Norris sought to have the judge's orders overturned. It has been ruled that the lawsuit can move forward, but at this time, there's no further information on the lawsuit that's available. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of the tragic story of what happened to Chandler Ashton Grafner. He is buried at the Mount Olive Catholic Cemetery in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. Rest easy, Chandler. Rest easy, baby boy. You are free. If you haven't done so and you get anything out of this video, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment with your thoughts. And if you have a case suggestion, please send it to me at Jenny, period, Elisa, period, at gmail.com. And until the next video, toodles. I am equal parts of Abel and of King.